We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? And oh, welcome back. Okay, let me adjust that level. There we go. Okay, no, no, a little more. Oh, there, okay, there we go. Okay. Yeah, just uh, just adjusting some levels, because apparently I've been recording a little bit too hot all night long. So welcome back to a really Radio uh, 135C, recorded Friday, December 9th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your stand account, and I've got my usual suspects, Stephen Griffith and Daniel Atherton. And this is the Law and Order segment. So, <clears throat> Pfizer fined for overcharging the British National Health Service. Well, there's a shocker. Yeah, no, the the shocker should be the percentage that they were overcharging. Tens of millions of pounds. They were overcharging the NHS 2,600%. Holy mother! Somewhere, pharma guy is smiling. Yeah. Wow. The 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 Competition and Markets Authority of the UK said these extraordinary price rises have cost the taxpayers tens of millions of pounds. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. the NH spending on Phenytoin sodium capsules, an anti-epilepsy drug used by 48,000 patients within the UK, had rocketed from two million pounds a year in 2012 to about 50 million the following year. And UK what, prices for the drug were many times higher than in the rest of Europe. Wow. And here I thought we were always having problems here in the United States. No. And mm. and this is why you need to put in caps on how much the market can raise the prices for life saving and life maintaining drugs. Ah, uh, okay. But here's why. Pfizer used to market the medicine under the brand name Apoutin. I've totally butchered that, but it's a drug name, so who cares? <clears throat> but then sold the rights to the company Flynn, a privately owned British company, in September 2012. It was then debranded, allowing the firms to charge more for the drug because it was no longer subject to a pricing scheme agreed between the NHS and the drugs industry because the brand changed. They broke the collective bargaining agreement. Yeah. Let's just call it for what it is. They broke the collective bargaining agreement by yeah. a bait and switch. Yeah. So at this point, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it's clever. It's clever. It's just using the tools that you have to their fullest extent. But how could they have gotten around this? Perhaps the the actual formulary of the of the the medicine being what is the fingerprint of it um the best you know the best way to to whereas if if and... that formulary is then in any name recognition whatsoever it's still in the same pricing category again yeah. what what you're going to have to and what you're going to see legislatures do not just here in the US but across the globe because pharma is a problem yeah it it just is. Health should not be for profit. Anyone who says otherwise is insane. Uh, I I hate to to sound a, a little radical here, but it's the truth. Yeah. Um, is you're going to have to make it so that the patent and the agreed upon pricing is for the chemical compound. It doesn't matter what you're calling it. It's for the chemistry involved and its purpose. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to have incredibly narrow definitions so that private interest yeah. doesn't screw the public health and well-being. So Pfizer said in a statement, get this, okay? This is where we need to have like a lawyer on just to – but a lawyer would just go, yep. Yeah. 
That's what they're going to do. Pfizer refutes the findings set out in the Competition and Markets Authority decision. In this transaction and in all our business operations, we approach this divestment with integrity and believe it fully complies with established competition law. Well, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Yeah. However, however, again, the spirit the, the, the of it has been as yeah. they were because of how they, again, this is one the positives of ha- having a a a single payer system is you force the market to compete like the military industrial complex and they have to bid low if they yeah. want the contract. Pfizer bid low on the capsules, and then when they realized they were losing money on the capsules. They divested and sold to another company who rebranded the capsules, which were still needed by the government. They held the the, the patent then to those capsules Mm -hmm. and could, by rebranding, upcharge it astronomically. So Pfizer, while they're in a legal gray area because they're the ones that held on to the contract. Now, well, yeah, they're, they're only, it's were... only a gray area if the uh, if the magistrate in charge happens to have a soul. <laughs> um, <laughs> if no, you know, he... because if they don't, if if we go through and it's just by the book, they win. Yeah. No, the but here's the thing. It's still a gray area to a degree, depending on how the contract between the NHS and Pfizer is worded. Um, For Pfizer was the one on the hook to provide the drug. So in the sale, Mm. they could still be on the hook for what Flynn did. And this is why the suit's being brought, in my opinion. The, The Flynn transaction represented an opportunity to secure outgoing supply of an important medicine for patients with epilepsy while maintaining continuity of manufacture. Continuity of manufacture, which means so was Pfizer still making the drug while Flynn held the copyright? Well, that's my question. At that point, then Flynn would be contracting Pfizer to manufacture the. They would then be a compounding pharmacy at that point, and they would they would have no. Uh, no legal ramifications for what another company had them do because they're not selling it to them. They're just manufacturing it for them. Pfizer's off the hook, I think. It's Flynn that's going to get the the brunt of this because they're the ones that are doing the price gouging. Yeah, we will see because Pfizer could have broken their contract by the sale of the product because they were the ones supposed to be providing it to the government. Yeah, but at that point they made they made arrangements to make sure that the drug was still going to be available. They did not have anything to say about the pricing at that point because you cannot you cannot man, you you can't do that basically because a new a new contract would then have to be drawn up with the other company. And if this was an I that wasn't dotted or a T that wasn't crossed, then it's up to whoever wrote the contracts. Again, they could. I'm thinking that Pfizer could be in breach of contract with the NHS. I don't think they have a contract with the NHS for this medicine anymore. Because they don't make it anymore. They but sold they, it to another company. They sold the copyright, but they still make the drug. Again, they would be the compounding pharmacy that would be manufacturing it for the other company. Again, it, I mean, it, it, this is all ne- nesting dolls of contract litigation. Yeah. So it'll be interesting <laughs> to follow what, what's going on here and any ramifications thereof. Yeah. <laughs> Flynn Pharma, which bought the UK distribution rights from Pfizer, said the ruling was based on a wholly flawed understanding of the drugs market. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. 
Wow. Uh, huh. <clears throat> we believe that left unchallenged, the CMA's decision today would stunt investment in generics, eventually leading to a reduction in supply and less choice for doctors and patients, said David Fakes of Flynn Pharma. Yeah. David Fakes of Flynn Pharma. That name will live in infamy in my brain forever because it's just too appropriate. Yep. Um, so this is this is the standard holding hostage, you know, closing remark across the bow kind of thing. You know, well, you know, hey, if you uh, if you do this, then you know, maybe we uh, we aren't going to make any more generics, eh? And maybe uh, you're going to have a problem with the supply. That'd be a terrible thing for the patients, wouldn't it? Capiche? Essentially. Yeah. yeah. This is how pharma works. They're they're playing with people's lives. It's it's quite the fulcrum. It is it is quite the leverage that they have to get what they want. Ah, <sighs> okay. So that was a that that's a fun bit of law and order. And boy, were you right about it being law, man. We could di- we could dive into that one for a long time. Okay. Ah, uh, but staying over the EU. In the, well, oh wait, the Brexit. Never mind. We weren't in the EU. <laughs> well, let's go. Uh, let's go back to the old continent a little bit further. EU sues Germany and Britain over Volkswagen emissions scandal. Yes. Um, further ramifications of the European Union experiment. Um, as Brussels sees fit to uh, accuse not just Germany, Britain, but Spain and Luxembourg of not imposing the same kind of penalties VW faced here in the U.S. over its use of illegal software. Um, the European Commission has further call on Germany and U.K. claiming both refused to share details on breaches of EU emissions laws uncovered in national investigations this year with the EU. Because... We're all supposed to share info. Yeah. And they didn't. That's part of the reason why the suit's being brought up. Um, And if you go even further, by the government's own admission, pollution from diesel cars is one of the main reasons the UK is breaking legal air pollution limits. And the government has been ordered repeatedly to tackle the legal levels of NO2 pollution as soon as possible, yet the government has inexplicably failed to take action even where the car industry has knowingly put people's health at risk for years. This kind of deception demands a strong response by authorities, and since the government has failed to provide, the EU is stepping in. Which is what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Well. Okay, so... What are the results here? Where is this going to go? Other nations, uh, other nations' actions under the spotlight are the Czech Republic, Lithuania, and Greece. Uh, Germany argues EU rules in this area are poorly framed. However, Brussels insists that it's the nation's responsibility to make sure car makers comply with the law. I, yeah, isn't it? How would it not be? Yeah. Uh... Abiding by the law is first and foremost the duty of the car manufacturers. Elzbieta Binkowska, EU Good Internal job. Market Commissioner, said in a statement Thursday. Um, but national authorities across the EU must ensure that car manufacturers actually comply with the law, uh, she added. The VW emission scandal led Germany to order an EU-wide recall of 8.5 million Volkswagen vehicles. Um, yeah. Now, I know... Over here in the States, um, there wasn't really a suit against VW, but more that Mm. VW decided to um, pay a significant fine, which was agreed upon with the government. Um, I don't remember what that fine was. I see here. And uh, allow the, the cars to be recalled and reprogrammed or sold back. 
Um, $14.7 billion settlement over, over emissions in June 28th, uh, 2016. Uh, they were talking about also repurchasing the cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. Yeah. So and yet the governments of Germany and the UK did not get this far as we here in the States did. Um, and that's why the EU is suing their own nations. Um, well, we're, we're a bigger market, technically. <laughs> well, also, we have stricter standards. Yeah. That's the other thing. When it comes to specifically to diesel vehicles, we have stricter standards than most of Europe. Um, that's why diesel cars aren't really sold here in the States, is because of our strict laws. Um, while diesel is more of a way of life over in Europe which is part of the reason why they have more smog problems than we do over here. Yeah. Owners who elect to get their vehicles fixed, this is, uh, this is from the, the U.S., um, will also get a cash payment between $5,100 and $10,000 to compensate them for the lost value of the cars, as well as for Volkswagen's deceptive promise of clean diesel. Most of the buyers paid extra for a car with a diesel engine. Yeah. Um, for those of you that are not in the know on this, it's like, what are you talking about with the Volkswagen, the, the diesel thing? Uh, what they did was the EPA has strict emissions standards for what a car can uh, can send out the gas pipes, um, you know, based on uh, how much NO2 and, and all that. So in order to get around that, when the car was in a testing facility, it would act one way. When the car was not in a testing facility, it would act a completely different way. So, basically, they software hacked the car to behave itself properly and report all is well and clean in this diesel environment to the testing center. And as soon as it was no longer in test conditions, it went back to being a dirty old diesel. Yeah. Um, The main reason for this was because they could actually promise the gas mileage that they were advertising for these diesel vehicles because otherwise they would, in the testing environments to maintain actual standards, they would not be getting the gas mileage that was promised on the sticker. Right. Because there are consequences to doing things cleanly. Yeah. And that consequence uh, for, is less mileage because you're actually reburning the fuel in a way that does not generate any further um, energy. You have to do it. You have to burn it really, really efficiently inside the combustion chamber which takes away energy from the drivetrain. Something along those lines. So yeah, it um, basically <clears throat> big shenanigans. Oh, complete yeah. false uh-huh. advertising and lying to the Environmental Protection Agency and trying to kill the planet for, pro- for fun and profit. Yeah, and the thing is VW isn't the only ones who got their hand caught in the cookie jar. It's just they did it on the largest scale. Uh, Daimler's Mercedes-Benz and General Motors Opel and Fiat have also used sophisticated software-based techniques so their cars can pass official tests, despite emitting far higher levels of NOx on the road. Um, the governments that are brought up in the suit have two months to answer the EU Commission. It's so much fun. Ugh. Oh, when will they ever learn? Okay, and one last one here in the Law and Order segment. Yeah, this is oh, sort Orlando of Weekly. A, a fluff piece. <laughs> okay, federal court allows student from uh, students to form gay straight clubs after Florida school board blocked them. Well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. They should be able to. Yeah, the American Civil Liberties Union of Florida filed a lawsuit in 2013 on behalf of students at Carver Middle School in Leesburg, 
after Lake County School Board refused to allow the club. Uh, Gay Straight Alliance clubs are organizations made up of LGBTQ students and allies who advocate for an end to bullying and harassment of queer students. Um, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta found that the federal law guarantees all student groups in middle school and high school should have equal access to school resources if the school allows extracurricular clubs. Yep. Previously, a federal district court dismissed the student's case because it ruled the federal law did not apply to middle schoolers. Um, so, uh. no, again, one of the things I know that I found out uh, when I was uh, going through through school is just how strange the law applies to students. Um, yeah, um, our rights uh, when we're as students are in uh, basically in escrow. That's how I heard it. Uh, heard it charged because we don't actually have those rights, but those rights are kept for us by those that administer the school and our parents. When you're a minor, yeah, it, 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 it's it's a strange legal place that I I still don't quite fully comprehend. Um. You're not the only one. To... That's why there's there's lawyers for that. <laughs> um, love to have somebody on to just do an entire like section on. Okay, how does law apply to students? Okay, um, I will. Uh, I'll talk to. Uh, I I have a lawyer that would that would be interested in coming on. Awesome. So uh, law uh, in regards to students. Yeah, I I think that would be a wonderful informative piece. Another one like uh, your. How about how about minors? That just, would be a good just one. Just minors in general. Yeah. Uh, how the law applies to minors, students, um, because I I have a feeling that's gonna come relevant under the Trump administration. It may. Just, it may. Just um, just say. The uh, the attorney that I'm that I'm speaking of is uh, Andrew Torres. He is a, a podcaster and as well and he's um he has a podcast which i i highly recommend everybody listen to it's called opening arguments so go ahead and put that into your into your podcast machine and pull that down and listen to all of them all of them they're exceptional opening arguments opening arguments um yeah he's uh very smart <laughs> and you know whereas we're talking about you know you know movies and things like that he's reading legal briefs for fun hmm. you know that's that's the guy it's what he does so he's he's a total law nerd and is all about it so yeah good guy Definitely would love to have one he, I, I reached out to him, and he would like to. He would, he's willing to guest, so I would like to have Fantastic. him on too. And now we have a subject for him, so now I can, I can work on doing that. So Alex Smith and Andrew Torres. That's the one. So for anybody out there, what I have on my phone is Podcast Addict, where I get all my podcasts, and they're on there. Podcast Addict is good, and uh, I use um, Pocket Casts, C A S T S, um, and now. For those of you that aren't aware, uh, most of those podcast apps are simply getting the feed from iTunes. They're just scraping the iTunes directory. Like, I'm in there. You can find me, you know, with O'Reilly Radio. But all I did was submit to iTunes. There are certain podcatch podcatcher apps that don't do that. And then you have to go through manually and you have to add it. Those are a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of like the way they do it, but yeah. Um, so most of them, as long as, you know, if you are a budding podcaster and you have questions, just certainly email me, um, oh, really radio podcast at gmail.com, and I'll, I'll give you what information I can. Um, but yeah, everything pretty much goes through iTunes. They are the, the masters of this medium, whether we like it or not. They don't store it, though. They don't store the media itself. That is all stored elsewhere. They just store a pointer to it. And update the RSS feed, basically. That's all it is. So, now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Okay, so, um, 
so the ACLU is at least fighting for for our rights continuously. So uh, this season of giving, should you be looking for a charitable donation to get in under the wire, you know, for your your tax season, and you just want to do a good thing, especially with the uh, the current political climate in the United States and elsewhere, uh, the ACLU is probably a nice place to shove some money. Just gonna say, just lay that out there. I think that's good for the law and order segment. Any any other takeaways from this one? Uh, again, I, I have a feeling that um, the ACLU is going to get very busy very soon. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just nice to have a positive piece in law and order. <laughs> Honestly. Yes. Yes, indeed. We would like to have more positive pieces. Uh, I did note uh, today that, uh, let me see. No, I didn't didn't bother to bring it up. But there are, um, there were seven new cases that were accepted by the, uh, by the Supreme Court, by the SCOTUS. And they are, um, they're going to be hearing like, you know, five hours of, you know, our opening arguments and things like that about all of them. So, We'll see a few new things come in from uh, the United States Supreme Court, or the Supreme Court of the United States. Let's go to us. Yeah, that's it. So, eh, we'll be uh, we'll be keeping track of that through the rest of the year as well. And ah, that was a nice short one. How about that? So, if you've enjoyed what we do here, you can help us out. There are four ways that you can do that. You could donate to the show through patreon.com slash overlyradio and get early access to the show content. Uh, you can also leave us a great review out on iTunes. That'll help gain show audience. That's always awesome. And speaking of show audience, you could also share the show with someone you love. Let them know about us. Share it with everyone. Shout it from the rooftops. That would be lovely. And of course, engage with us directly. Send us a message on the social medias or the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're more talkative sort, how about 470-222-6759? That's 470-222-6759. It's always ready to take your call or your text messages. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time with us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, with the exception of music created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com, who holds the copyright thereto.